week on Quality Digest Live. Can we keep politics out of business? Or anything else for that matter? Plus, are your quality policies nothing more than propaganda? Well, we'll find out when we come back. Today's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Hexagon Metrology. Hexagon carries the widest range of quality brands. With an extensive support network, Hexagon is also your partner. Hexagon Metrology. We are Metrology. Well, welcome back to Quality Digest Live for July 19th, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richman. First up in the news this week, all of us at Quality Digest would like to welcome aboard our latest regular contributor, Sean Wisner. His new column, Point by Point, debuted in Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Sean is a well-experienced applications engineer with Hexagon Metrology. As such, he is well-positioned. <laughs> in 3D space. So to speak. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> to talk about matters of coordinate metrology. So whether you're a veteran metrologist or new to the field, you are sure to get some good, very practical information out of Sean's column on a monthly basis. Starting next month, he's going to be diving into the deep waters and explaining the differences between data collection and data management, always a pertinent topic within metrology. Now, if you have a specific question about hardware, software, data, best practices, anything within 3D Metrology, send them on to us at feedback at qualitydigest.com, and we'll forward them on to Sean, and I'm sure that Sean will be sure to answer them in a forthcoming column of Point by Point. That's right, and just, uh, uh, Sean's going to be drawing from his own experience, his own experience uh, out in the field, mm -hmm. so uh, these are going to be questions that really are pertinent to, to what's going on with you guys who are using 3D Metrology out in the field, so be sure to get those questions in. That's right. Uh, we well, here are a couple of standard stories for you. First of all, ISO is offering uh, the ISO 22000 collection of standards for safe food supply chains on its online browsing platform. This is a, uh, these standards, 22000, uh, if you're not familiar with them, are to uh, help companies in the food chain implement food safety management systems. The, the new collection gives access to the eight standards and technical specifications currently making up the ISO 22000 family. Uh, quotes of uh, I'm sorry, not quotes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just quotes on there. <laughs> it looks like quotes on there. Uh, well, according to ISO, in any case, it'll help you get a grip on your food safety hazards. Uh, for only four, 375 Swiss francs, or about $400, you can access and view online the complete portfolio of standards making up the food safety family of standards directly in your library. So go check that out. Uh, by the way, mm -hmm. for those of you who aren't familiar, standards documents are copyrighted. Yes, they are. Do not try to download and sell them. It is really frowned upon. It is very much frowned <laughs> upon by ISO. Yes, it's actually their, their business. Is this is their business. This is, how they, this is how they make money. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, just ask Chen Zeming, Deputy Manager of Wenzhou Nalong Import and Export Trading Company Limited. According to ANSI, Chen was accused of illegally downloading 1,545 ISO and ASTM standards documents uh, from the internet between November 2009 and February 2011. 1,545. 1,545 documents. If nothing else, he's a completer. <laughs> he's had plenty, plenty of time on he's his hands. He's been busy. He then sold those documents on his website for more than $13,000. Wow, so what a Chen bargain. was sentenced to one year in prison with two additional years of probation, required to pay a fine of more than $32,000 and to turn over all the illegal profits related to his actions. According to ANSI, the ruling demonstrates China's willingness to crack down on copyright infringement within its borders. So there you go, don't yeah. do that. Don't, don't do that, the Chinese take that very seriously. But it, it, it's good to see, it's good to see, because yeah. it, that is, I mean, actually it happens more often than we like to think it does. Right, well standards, I mean, and look, it, <laughs> standards are expensive. If you've ever gone out, uh, some of these standards are really expensive. Mm -hmm. If you've ever gone out to, well matter of fact, we're just, the story before that, uh, $4,000 uh, $4, to access the, uh, the, the 22,000 family of mm -hmm. standards. Well. If somebody's offering it on the internet, sure. the same thing for maybe 50 bucks, yeah. 
uh, the temptation is really there. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, you know, small companies, you know, they got, it just happens. It's a fact yeah. of life. So. Well, it's good to see the, the Chinese government cracking down on copyright infringement in this scope because it's much broader than <laughs> it's that. It's much broader than I mean, that, yeah. we certainly know in the, in the realm of intellectual property, uh, apart from just standards, that this is a major problem in China right. and a lot of places, not just China. Let's not just be harsh on the Chinese, but yeah. I mean, it's a problem across the world and in the U.S. too. So yeah. good to see, good to see the government there cracking down on that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Wrapping up this week's news, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies Manufacturing Extension, Extension Partnership recently anointed October 4th, 2013 as Manufacturing Day. Others involved in promoting Manufacturing Day include the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association, the National Association of Manufacturers, and its Manufacturing Institute, among others. The purpose of this event is to promote and showcase America's advanced manufacturing workplaces. During Manufacturing Day, manufacturers across the land will open their doors to demonstrate what today's high-tech production environments are really all about. Manufacturing Day is also intended to kick off opportunities for young people just entering the workforce. Internships in particular are desperately needed to introduce potential job applicants to the industry and provide the hands-on experience that manufacturers seek. Now, the creation of good manufacturing jobs in the U.S., we talked about it a lot, as well as the development of the right applicants to succeed in those jobs, uh, it, it's really an issue that's being addressed by a lot of people. It's being addressed by the educational system, it's being addressed by industry, uh, and it's being addressed by government too. NIST, after all we all know, is a federal agency, and they've thrown the weight of their efforts behind many initiatives of this kind over the past several years. So, it, it, you may not think, you, you may not think, if you don't think that it's the business of government to intervene in these matters, well, hold on your hat. Dirk is going to be covering a piece from our very own Ryan Day coming up in less than a minute that you'll want to pay very close attention to, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So stay, stay tuned for that. So for more information on this news item, as well as everything else that Dirk and I are going to be covering on today's show, just click on the story links that are right below the video screen, right about down there. Right. Nice segue, by the way. Yes. Well, I try. You know, we try. We try. We try to practice this. Well, as Mike said, Ryan Day, our social media slash webmaster slash staff columnist slash whatever else he can get his hands on, uh, wrote an interesting article this week, The Politics of Quality. Mm -hmm. Great title. And Ryan was responding to a comment on one of our online articles. I think it was mm -hmm. an older article. Uh, and the comment was along the lines of, we shouldn't drag politics into, into this. this. Yeah. Uh, to which Ryan's editorial response was, uh, really? Really? Yeah. Politics influences every aspect of our lives, particularly our jobs. Uh, as Ryan points out, as a business owner or CEO or accountant or human resources person or Editor. health and safety person or yeah. whatever, yeah. your job is governed by the decisions that at some point were made at a political level, often for political reasons and sometimes even for political gain. We are all at the mercy of those who make decisions at the local, state, or federal government levels. So, I mean, what we're talking, you, you think about, you know, labor laws or OSHA regulations, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Americans with Disability Acts, environmental laws, and so forth. These are all laws that affect what we do in the workplace. In the workplace and yeah. you do have to pay attention to them. And, you're, and, and you should actually, I believe, and we'll get to this a little bit, I think it should even be the source of discussion mm -hmm. in the workplace, not just at the CEO level, but further down too, because eventually all these laws, maybe the CEO pays attention to them, yeah. but the CEO's passing the responsibility for putting whatever regulations in place, those eventually trickle down to your shop floor or your, or mm -hmm. your office people. So. Yes, even if you do it kicking and screaming, you do drag politics into the workplace. By the way, many, if not most industries, probably including yours, have lobbyists, those are people who work with politicians, working on their behalf in state and federal governments. And, and you know, I mean, think about it. Do you think people like, you know, Bill Gates or, or the late uh, uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs yeah. You know, did they ignore the impact of political decisions no. on, on the business? Of course not. I mean, yeah. they're in there mixing it up. They're yeah. talking to politicians. Yeah. They're, you know, they, they've got the clout to, um, mm -hmm. to get, you know, a politician's ear. Of course, politics is part of it. But I want to take this, actually, discussion a little bit further. One of my pet peeves is the idea that we leave our, our, our political or religious or environmental or health views or, or whatever at the door when we come to work. Right. That the idea that we come to work and somehow we just magically set all this aside and we're just little flesh machines and we go and we do our job and you know we plug this into there and we write things and we do that and somehow we do this completely without a context. That's nonsense. Of course we all operate within the context and, and we, we should. And I, I believe these, these ideas and viewpoints and so forth should be brought 
to the workplace. I'll get to that why in just a minute. And I don't mean that we should be proselytizing. I don't mean it's right to have employees or management, you know, trying to get people to, to come over to their political view or their religious views or, or whatever those views are. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking that a workplace should be open to the free flow of ideas, even if it's ideas that you may disagree with. Mm -hmm. I think they got to be presented in the right way, and that's always where it's tricky. You got to make sure you're not stepping on somebody's toes. You got to make sure somebody is, doesn't feel like they're being harassed, whatever that means, um, and so forth. But I think the idea that when you walk into the workplace, and now you know, just be sure you know you don't put like an Obama for president or the Tea Party mm -hmm. rocks sticker in your office cubicle, your mm -hmm. own office cubicle. Uh, I, I think that's that's silly. I, I think we come with a sense of who we are. And I think as long as you're not stepping on somebody's toes overtly by doing that, I'm not sure there's a problem with it. I don't know if there's a problem with it. I think what, what, the, what the reader who, who initially wrote the comment, let's get politics out of this, was really talking about was the idea that, that there are, there's an emotion to political discussions. And I think that, that you want to maybe step back from that if you can. You're not going to leave it at the door. You're not going to not be who you are when you're in, in the office and when you're in a discussion maybe. But... I think the idea is that you're going to take a step back from the emotionalism of that and you're going to look at hopefully just the data of, of, of an argument. I mean, we know the hot button, we, we know it all the time, we sure. talk about it with the hot button issues. If you talk about climate change, we know that we're going to, we're going to have that. We're going to get these, comments, these right. Or Six right. Sigma, I mean, it's another one that's yeah, more sure. specific to our industry. <laughs> yeah. We know that there, there's passion there. And politics as a, as a phrase is pretty darn broad, right. if you think about it. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean voting, it doesn't necessarily mean what government enacts. Politics can mean, you know, what you think, what you want to convey to somebody else emotionally, too. So that, as I think of the concept that the reader, the reader was initially referring to that Ryan says you can't take that, and you can't, you're right. You yeah. can't divorce it, but the idea that you want to try to, to, to winnow it out a little bit and be more database, I think, is what we're really getting to. Here. Exactly, and I, th I think that's my point, is, is um, and we learn from each other as, as a result of that, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, ethical issues yep. or, or being informed on what's going on in government that may influence your job. I think if these aren't discussed in the workplace, then really you're, you're uninformed. You don't know where your business is going. As a matter of fact, I would even argue you don't necessarily know how to deal in some cases with your customers. If you don't know what's going on with business, particularly, uh, and this would be relating more to the, the political industry, but I would say sometimes even, even ethical and religious views. If you don't understand where your customer is coming from, if you don't understand the ins and outs of these things, and then you're trying to deal with somebody who's maybe in the middle of that for whatever reason, then you're not going to relate to your customer in, in the right way. I think it's just, you know, one of these things that came to me is, you know, the United States has really been uh, uh, referred to often, you know, it's the great melting pot, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's, you know, supposed to be one of our strengths, is we have all these divergent views and religions and ideas, and they, they all go together and the, the, the parts uh, end up creating something that's bigger than the whole. I think that is the case within the workplace as well. Um, I think it's just, you have to be careful how these things, uh, how these things are shared. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Benjamin Franklin referred to it, you know, 200 plus years ago as the marketplace of ideas. That right. that you, in this country, what we bring to it is, from all those divergent backgrounds, is you, you come armed to the discussion with knowledge. And, and you try to sway people to your point of view, maybe, and that's political. Again, that's right, getting right. back to the political realm of this. So, yeah, of course, there's going to be that element of it in, in the workplace. It's got to be. It should be. There, yeah. that's, the, that's the beating heart of an organization is, is passionate people who want to convey their viewpoints. I think the idea that we're going to keep pol keep politics out of it, as 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 the the writer said, who commented, who Ryan commented to, was again this idea that you don't want to forget about that, but you also want to not weigh it too heavily, and you don't want to. We're going to get to this. It's actually not another nice transition. Right. We're going to get to the idea of propaganda in a minute too. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. That you don't you don't want to, you don't want to propagandize. You don't want to uh, proselytize. Right. Uh, you want to to talk, and you want to have your passionate beliefs. You want to express that to your, your coworker, your boss, or your underling, whatever it may be. Uh, but you also want to do it uh, from a database perspective. Because ultimately, the decisions are going to come from that database perspective, I think. Right. Especially in our industry. I mean, quality assurance. I mean, it really all should be about the data. But it's, we know it's not all about the data. Yeah, it's not all, it's not all about the data. Yeah, we know it's well, I mean, get, to get back to Ryan's point here, um, if you're a business owner or a CEO, 
Uh, you need to keep abreast yeah. of what is happening in politics. You, you, you need to bring politics into it, at least in terms of your own personal information, and you need that in order to be prepared. Call it, a, call it risk management. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan, in his article, gives a handful of resources uh, that you might actually find useful. But I say it's also important for middle managers and even the rank and file, because after all, if some new policy comes down the pike involving, say, health and safety regulations, good, good example, yeah. it is not going to be the CEO that implements those policies. Most likely, the nuts and bolts of those policies will be carried out by the shop floor of the office worker. So it really behooves them, you, me, to be prepared um, as well and to, st to stay informed. So thanks, Ar uh, Ryan, for a, for a good article, for a yeah. thought-provoking article there. So. Well, something you mentioned, Dirk, which I think is really great, is, is the, the references that Ryan provides. Ryan, Ryan traditionally does that with his pieces. Yeah. He has well-referenced, well-researched pieces. And you, know, you can go back and you can see the evolution of his thought process through some of the, the references that he uses in, in his pieces. So uh, you, know, you, can, you can debate him. I mean, he, what, Ryan's a great debater. <laughs> Ryan loves to, to mix it up. Uh, and, and certainly, when you read him, when you read any of us, but when you read Ryan, uh, if you disagree and you take another perspective, that's awesome. That's great. Write it up for us. Comment on the blog on our, on our, our webpage. Ryan or one of us will certainly get back to you, and we'll have a good good discussion about it, and yep. we'll we'll see if we can keep politics out of it or not. <laughs> We're all going to see if you keep keep propaganda out of it as well, because we had an article this week called "A Square Deal Is the Best Propaganda," and that was from our own uh, our, our good friend Bill Levinson, who's a frequent columnist of ours that appeared in uh, Thursday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. A square deal is, a good pro is the best propaganda. Well, what, it, what does he really mean by that? Well, what, what Bill means by propaganda is, is anything that, that kind of is intended to influence, right? Influence somebody. Um, and, you know, propaganda really is what it says, that anything uh, about quality initiatives uh, have to reflect actions. Right? If you're a quality person, you, what you say is one thing, but what you do really is, is what matters. And that's really akin to what Deming would have advised against, which is against sloganeering. It's very closely tied to that, propaganda and, and sloganeering. And it doesn't just apply to quality professionals. It doesn't just apply to internal customers. Uh, it really applies to external customers as well. And, and Bill uses a great example, I think, of, of supermarkets, groceries. And, and this idea of reusable bags, which is a big thing now, certainly a big thing here in California. Sure, yep. We talk about it a lot with, you know, you, you look I think, at I it. I think LA is going to be uh, uh, getting rid of uh, paper and plastic, they, right? They are, and yeah. here in our hometown of Chico, there's been a lot okay. in the last couple of years about, about uh, plastic bag bans right. and that kind of thing. Um, so what Bill is talking about is he's using this example of, of markets that are going to try to, try to bring this to, to their consumers because they, they think it's, it's good for sustainability, they're green, whatever it may be. So he uses two examples. Market A, perhaps, charges 99 cents for a usable bag, okay? They charge 99 cents for a reusable bag, uh, but market B, perhaps, again, in this example, would charge 99 cents for the reusable bag, but it also give you a five, per, five cent discount each time you use it. So, you know, you shop once a week, let's say. Yeah. Over the course of half a year or so, you'll have paid for your bag. Now, I mean, it's a dollar, right? 99 yeah. cents. Not, but the example is, is a good one here because we're looking at the idea of how you're going to put your money where your mouth is. So the, the store, the grocery is saying, we want to be green, we want to be sustainable, we want to support that, so we're going to do that by offering these reusable bags. But if what they're doing is they're just charging you 99 cents for a bag and they're not letting you buy into the process where you can earn that back in some way. Or, well, well there, there, there's, a, there's a bit you're missing out here. So you buy a 99 cent bag, right. the supermarket stops buying right. paper and plastic, right. so right. they're saving money on both, on and, both and, and, and making, making money yeah, yeah. And, and, and they're not giving anything back, That's, yeah. the, the, the benefit's all there. It's, it's all there. So, yeah. so this is what we're talking about here. Is this, is this propaganda? I mean, yes, they're saying that they're for it, and it is. it does help. It yeah. does help, but ultimately, really what they're doing is they're finding a way to save some money and make some money at the same time. Yeah, and there's so, no incentive, by the way, there's also no incentive for the, for the, for the buyer. For the buyer. For, for, for the consumer, there's no incentive yeah. it, it, for market A. For market yeah. B, there is, there is because yeah. they're giving you that five cent discount each time you use the bag. This, this particular example that, that Bill used there sparked uh, a comment from, from Dirk Van Putten. And Dirk, Dirk Van Putten is a, uh, a frequent comment, commenter. Yeah. That's the other Dirk. The other Dirk. We, we, love, we love all of our Dirks. <laughs> Dirk Van Putten wrote in and, and, and grabbed a hold of that, that, that piece of, of Bill's argument and said, the reason for having reusable bags as an individual financial benefit, each shopper is a piece of a larger system. 
99 cents for a reusable bag seems to me to be a great deal for the benefit of lower energy demand, raw material costs, and pollution. I guess what is propaganda is an individual opinion. So Dirk saying there that 99 cents, hey, you know, what the heck? It's only 99 cents. It's a great deal to yeah, so, have, these, have all these savings. So Dirk, Dirk is looking just, just only at the big picture. At he's the saying, big picture. He's he, saying, you know, forget about the, basically what I'm reading between the lines there. Is he saying... You know, forget about the the personal gain or savings or whatever. On your you're, side, you're helping the environment, it, and it's only costing you 99, 99 cents. cents. It's yeah. a good thing you should be doing yeah. it anyway. Okay. So, but Bill responded to that. I think I think well. And what Bill said uh, on top of that was the bottom line is, however, that if a grocer, if the grocer in question was really really concerned about the environment, it would give out the returnable bags for free. Maybe one for every few hundred dollars of purchases as tracked on a shopper's club card. So people wouldn't grab handfuls of them for non-shopping related uses instead of selling them. So what Bill is saying there is, is if the grocer really does want to do that, they, they, they just give away, right? I mean, what the heck? It's, it's, it's also yeah. not a lot of money. Yeah. Um, Matter of fact, they'd probably be paying for the bags from what they're saving on what buying the paper. And not, having to, not having to buy them on the other end, yeah. right? So all these examples, this example, there's another example that Bill uses too, uh, and I know, I know we're running a little later, so I'm gonna, gonna get to it quickly. No, another example Bill talks about is cap and trade on carbon emissions, where, where you know, th there's this pronouncement of sustainability for the world, but ultimately, there's these, these hedge funds, these people making money on these things, because they're gonna, they're gonna right, be investing right. in this stuff. So really, is there a benefit to, to the world, is there a benefit to the consumer, or is it really just a benefit to the people that are, that are mer merchandising and marketing these things? Um, I think, if you look at this, again, I think what really, really, when you think about it is, if you don't incentivize the customer, the customer in this is always the biggest chunk of movement, right? right? But if you don't make it easy for him or her to do that, it's not going to happen. Look at recycling in this country, right? 20, 30 years ago, there wasn't a heck of a lot of recycling. But recycling took hold when local municipalities and governments said, okay, well, we're going to give you garbage bins. Right. We're going to give you different colored bins for your paper, for your plastic, for your glass. We'll make it easy for you. And you have to cart it down to the car curb, of course. But that made it a lot easier. And now recycling is really taking hold in this country because they made it easy for the customer. Right. right. If you don't, if you just make it burdensome for them, or if you look at it as a profit center, it's just propaganda. You're not really supporting what you say you want to support. Same thing with quality. You know, you're either gonna gonna walk your walk or you're gonna talk your talk or you're not gonna do either one, right. but you have to really embody it in action, not just in words. Um, and of course, like he always does, Bill brings us back to Henry Ford. Henry Ford talked about this hundred years ago. The idea that that if you're going to be more efficient, if you're gonna if you're gonna make your workers be more productive. If you want them to be more, more productive, you have to incentivize them, you have to give them more money, you have to let them see the reward in the productivity gains. If you don't, if you just say, be more productive, work harder, here's your same paycheck every month, it's not sustainable. It's not gonna happen over the long due course of time. It might be a short-term benefit, but it's not gonna take hold. And that's what we're talking about here, is propaganda is never gonna work. It's never gonna work long-term. Slogans are never gonna work long-term. It's only if you make the actions work and buy in everybody who's all the stakeholders, including most importantly the customers. Make them all buy in, make them all have a vested interest, and then you'll have an improvement that's going to really take hold. Well, I think it was either in one of his comments or maybe it was in the article, but he had a quote from Ford, which I think he's used before. Something along the lines is that in a, in a transaction, both parties have to benefit. Absolutely. And, 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 and so it has to be mutually beneficial. So yeah. going back to the, the, the grocery idea or even the cap and trade idea, um, if only one side is benefiting from it, then, then you aren't really, you aren't really, number one, you're disincentivizing it yes. for the other party, but also you're not really accomplishing uh, the goal that you're trying to set out to reach. Either. You are in a short term. I mean, sure, short term, in, yeah. in, in a few weeks or months, maybe you can achieve a goal, but, but that's not, you know, as professionals, that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to achieve sustainable long-term improvements uh, to our businesses and to the world. And, and the only way that happens, again, is to buy everybody in. By the way, really I mean, in. this also touches it kind of obliquely on voice of the customer. Yeah. So the reason a lot of the supermarkets are doing this and why people have green in their name and all that is because they know there's a market out there for people who want to be or feel that they're being environmentally conscious with their purchases. But if all you're doing is just sloganeering or putting green on your name, um, you're also really being dishonest yeah. with, with the customer as well. I mean, sure, you may, not to say that there isn't a benefit, you know, let's, let's talk, getting back to Dirk and Putin's point, is sure there's still a benefit if you're paying 99 cents, you're not getting a discount, that's fine, but put your money where your mouth is, let the customer know that you're buyed into it, you as, as the supplier, as the grocer or whatever, are bought into this as well, and you're willing to put your money yeah. where your mouth is. And, and by the way, those of us that are in sales, that, that do sales for a living, uh, understand this really intrinsically, because 
you, we know that we're not going to get those orders long term unless we provide real value. And you can always sell the sizzle. You can always do that if you're, if you're good, if you're fast on your feet. Uh, you can always do that. But you can't do it, really. If you don't understand your customer's requirements or really address them, really answer them, you're not going to have a business. Right. And that's really what this comes down to. And Bill, Bill talks about that pretty much uh, all the time in his, in his work. So now it's, uh, it's time for our Tweet of the Week. Tweet of the Week. We need, we need a, we need we need a music whistle to go or something. This, yeah. <laughs> we now turn to our Tweet of the Week. Yes. Uh, this is a new column, which we've, we are running now in, uh, in, in Quality Digest. We're going to do that regularly. And this one you can place, I think, pretty firmly in the Man Bites Dog file. Man Bites Dog file. I love that one. This one comes to us from Seracis, a freight logistics company, earlier this week. They tweeted out a link to the Fox Business News program, After the Bell, titled, Bringing Toy Manufacturing Back to the U.S., in the linked story, which you can access there through their Twitter feed, accompanied uh, in the linked story is accompanied by a video interview conducted by the, the fabulous, magnificent, after the bell hostess, Liz Clayman. Liz Clayman, late, late of CN, CNBC News, now with Fox Business News. And in the interview, we hear the story of Kinex, which is a toy manufacturer, which has not only brought its toy manufacturing operations back to the US from China, but they are now selling made in the U.S. toys in the China market. I love that. That's right. Way to go, Connects. That's great stuff. I, you know, like I said, it's a man bites dog story. You know, it's not news if, if the dog bites the man. But this is great. I mean, so what they found is this is this is a reshoring deal. Sure. What they found is not only was there a benefit to manufacturing here because of better quality and yeah. and, and, and slow and, and shorter logistics, sure. uh, less supply chain issues, but they also found that they could profitably export back into China. But you know, you think about it, China's an exploding consumer market. Yeah. You know, those people, the, the consumers in China have money. They're starting to get more money than they ever have had before, and they may want better quality toys. Well, and, and not only that, there, there is, uh, in, in some markets in China, they're, they're, the Chinese are also as leery of Chinese, Chinese products, sure. Chinese products yeah. as, as, uh, as we are, are in the United States in some yeah. cases. Yeah. I mean, there was a great story on how many Chinese are buying baby, uh, baby food products they're not buying them from China. No. They're, they're paying huge amounts of money to have their stuff brought in or shipped in from, from Germany. Well, this, because they don't trust the, tri the Chinese right. food manufacturers. Well, see, this is, this is why this is so encouraging. This is why the reshoring stuff is so encouraging for those of us who are Amer American and, and, and tied to American manufacturing because it's branding. We know that Made in the USA brand is a powerful brand, man. Yeah. That, that carries a lot of weight across the world. And, and that's something that I think we need to tap into a little bit more in this industry is to be proud of Made in the USA. That's a really powerful statement across the world. Yep. So good stuff there from Connects. Thank you guys for doing that. And by the way, if you want to connect with us on Twitter, just visit uh, www.twitter.com slash quality digest and click follow. And then who knows, maybe you'll be. Yeah, we'll get, your, we'll get you link. on the Tweet of the week. The tweet of the week. That's right. Okay. Well, that's our show for the week. But oh, that's right. We're, all, gosh, that's, we're, we're out of time. Out of time. There, there it is. Yeah, we're, we, we're, we're out of time. That's our show for the week. But before we go, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Hexagon Metrology. Hexagon Metrology is committed to helping you control your processes, enhance the quality of your products, and increase efficiencies. They empower you to stay one step ahead of a changing world with their wide range of product offerings, nearly 200 years of expertise, and an extensive support network. Hexagon Metrology, where quality comes together. So for more information, just click on the banner ad just below or just to the right of the video player page right down there. That's right. And next week, uh, we'll be at the CMSC, the Coordinate Metrology Systems Conference in San Diego. Look out for a special QDL from the floor of the show this coming Wednesday, next Wednesday, yep. July 24th, at our regular time of 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. That show will be rebroadcast uh, re at our regular day and time next Friday as well. Yeah, so you can catch it, uh, catch it live, live in living color, you and I down in San Diego, beautiful San Diego. Oh man, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to that. So we'll be there Wednesday uh, yep. at the regular time. And then uh, if you miss it or you want to watch it again, or, and again and again and again, you can just tune back in regular time next week, you know, a week from now, and, and we'll, be, we'll be at you on tape uh, uh, at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2, 2 p.m. Eastern uh, next Friday. Oh, That's okay. right. Okay, finally, well, we want to let one of our longtime contributors, Timothy Bednarz, know that he is very much in our thoughts. That's right. That's right, he is. Timothy has been diagnosed with cancer, and the costs for his treatment, as you, you can well imagine, are excessive. Uh, thus, Timothy's friends and family have set up a fund 
to help defray those expenses. And we encourage you, if you're able, please give if you can. A really good cause. You know, Timothy's written for us. Uh, we uh, we have like stuff for a 20, long time. 21 articles. 21 there, articles, so. yeah. And, and really good. We were just talking about it. Really good yeah, uh, advice. He's, he's actually, uh, some people might find his writing a little academic. I actually really like it. His, his stuff is just very to the point. He's mm -hmm. a management writer, yep. uh, management topics, uh, but very just, to me, common sense. Um, but thought-provoking and just just really to the point, easy to read, yep. uh, management articles. So, I mean, if you want to read some of his stuff, I, I, if you're a manager and you want just good management content, just go to our website, type uh, Tim Bednarz, B-E-D-N-A-R-Z, B-E-D-N-A-R-Z, yeah. uh, in the upper right corner in our search box here, you'll, you'll find his articles. Yeah. Uh, really good management reading, and so um, really have been, been really happy to have Tim uh, as a columnist. We're, we're looking forward to him getting better and coming back as that's well. Right. So. That's right, that's right. And good book, too. His, his, his book uh, oh, right. is, is uh, What Makes Managers Great. It, you can access that link through his articles as well, and, and check that out. That's actually So excellent. you know what? You know what? Don't drink, don't drink uh, you know, lattes for, for, uh, for a month. Yeah. You got yourself a hundred bucks. That's right. There you go. <laughs> just a thought. Just a thought. Links down below. This bottom link at the very bottom of the player, pay, play, player page will take you out to uh, Give Forward, yes. which is a, uh, a crowdsourcing site, uh, typically for, for people with medical conditions and so forth, cancer patients. Uh, it's a well-respected site, um, secure. Uh, if you do want to give uh, some money to, uh, to Tim Bednarz and his family to help defray their, uh, their excessive medical costs, uh, that would certainly be welcome. Yep, we encourage you to so, do so. That's right. Well, that wraps up our show for today. Thank you all for joining us, and we are going to see you next week, as we said, at the CMSC in San Diego. That's right, and we'll be back at you next week with a great week of Quality Digest Daily. And uh, so have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you then. So long. Bye.